I suspect many of you have a special place in nature. Some place you go when life feels a little bit too noisy and stressful. A sanctuary. Turns out you're not alone. The most popular Airbnb rental on the planet isn't a huge coastal mansion or a swanky downtown condo. It's a tiny cabin nestled in the California woods. So perhaps it's the woods that is the sanctuary and the cabin is merely an accessory. With or without the cabin, nature is the common denominator when we seek out these kind of peaceful retreats. So let's consider those special places in nature that we go to heal from life's traumas as natural sanctuaries. John Muir proposed this 100 years ago when he wrote, thousands of tired, nerve-shaken, over-civilized people are beginning to discover that going to the mountains is going home, that wildness is a necessity, that nature parks and reservations are more than just fountains of timber and irrigating rivers, they're fountains of life. In the spirit of John Muir, I became curious about my own interpretation of a natural sanctuary, remote wild places untrammeled by man. I pondered uh, this question, what does it mean to be remote, uh, when I saw a Verizon billboard that was advertising a wash of red cell coverage across the United States. I became curious about those small isolated pockets on the map where there was no coverage. I next saw a light pollution map of the US and again, my interest was piqued by those places that felt like dark oases in a sea of light. I began to consider what it meant for me to be remote. If I could be in a designated wilderness and look up and see the night sky obscured by light pollution, or if I could text and Facebook from my sleeping bag, that didn't feel like the true wilderness, my natural sanctuary that I was looking for. So it evoked the question, where was the most remote place in the continental US? Together working with a GIS map maker, I came up with a list of distinct conditions that for me described my ideal of remote wilderness. Together we put together a layered map of remoteness and isolated a sliver about 22 square miles. After some Google Earth scouting, I recruited my adventure buddy Bryce to join me on a quick expedition to see it. It felt like a pilgrimage to someplace sacred. After leaving pavement, we drove 65 miles of dirt road, hiked 20 miles of trail, and arrived at the outermost edge of the civilized world. I felt light, untethered, and completely absorbed by the moment. Absent of man-made distraction, my mental clarity was at its peak, my senses invigorated. I think back to those 48 hours exploring this remote sanctuary as me being my best self. While the batteries on my phone were weakening, I was recharging off of nature. I grew up as an only child on Deer Creek out in Dixonville, and my childhood was spent playing in the woods and creek behind my house. Collective years of my life were spent building forts, doing yard work, yeah, yard work, right? Um, uh, fishing, and since living in Portland for the past 20 years, um, my various careers of teaching, tour guiding, and running a business have required a lot of people interaction. Um, as a child, I was introverted and shy around people, and now I spend a lot of time around people. I spend a lot of time at the computer, and I spend far too much time, more than I'd like, away from nature. See, the outdoors was my sanctuary, and while living in the city, I've drifted from that truth. Uh, Add in the relentless distraction of emails, text messages, social media, and the consequence has been a deterioration of my own mental health and a declining resilience to those ebbs and flows of life. I'm more susceptible to depression, anxiety, stress, and questioning my own self-worth. My relationships with other people suffer because while I may be present, the noise in my mind prevents me from being present for those other people. Two years ago, I put my life on hold and took a sabbatical for my work because I was no longer able to pretend that I was okay or that I could simply flip a switch and get over it. I felt deep sadness, anxiety, insecurity. 
I felt empty. I would never imply that my circumstances were all that exceptional, but I had lost the mental resilience to overcome. Instinctively, I knew I needed to spend time in a remote wild place in order to tap into that state of mind that is calm, confident, and happy. I knew I needed to spend time in my natural sanctuary. Some may call it a midlife crisis. Others may diagnose it as depression. And while it felt very lonely, I also began to realize I was definitely not alone. Statistics regarding mental health in the United States are nothing short of pandemic. One in five adults will experience a mental illness in any given year. Yet over half go untreated. Now the consequences of no treatment are pretty predictable. Serious mental illness each year in the United States costs our country billions in lost earnings, is a leading cause of hospitalization and premature death. Estimates suggest that every day, between 18 and 22 veterans die by suicide. For those that are treated, we annually spend more on mental illness than heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. So what about alternatives to this tremendous cost for traditional care? It could require little more than spending time in a natural sanctuary. Across science, literature, culture, and politics, a consistent and universal theme emerges. Connecting with nature is good for people. Now, there are, whether it's the most remote place or the neighborhood park, anecdotal accounts of how it makes us feel better are endless. And it's a sentiment that seems to span otherwise contentious religious and political barriers. Even Chuck Norris, devout Christian, conservative, uber badass, this year wrote, spending time in nature is good for our health. Most of the history of our species was spent uh, lacking buildings and walls. We are essentially wired to live in the natural world. He goes on to reference a nature therapy developed in Japan in the early 90s called Shinrin-yoku. It's literally defined as forest bathing. It's very Chuck Norris of him. <laughs> well, science, as it turns out, is developing some powerful evidence-based relationships between spending time in nature and improvements in our mental health. In a 2010 study of Shinrin-yoku, researchers found that elements of the environment, such as the odor of wood, the sound of running stream water, and forest scenery could provide relaxation and reduce stress. Participants in the study experienced dramatic improvements in both mood and immunity. And there's no shortage of additional science to support these findings. Estimates suggest that the average American spends between 80 and 99% of their lives indoors, a trend that has led to a kind of nature deficit disorder. This isn't a medical diagnosis, but rather a term used to describe a lifestyle in which the conditions lead to poor psychological and physical health. Now, when treatments include a prescription to go spend time outdoors, nobody in this room is going to be surprised that these can be the outcomes. We have very expensive treatments for all of these conditions, yet it could be that nature has been the antidote to mental illness all along. Given the remarkable impact of these places on our well-being and the huge economic benefit of these spaces, a new value emerges beyond the traditional arguments made for conservation. For us to find health and healing in nature, we require access to nature. Now, does it matter whether it's the most remote place or the neighborhood park? In terms of quality of nature, yes. In terms of its capacity to provide healing for someone struggling with a mental illness, perhaps not. What's important is that each of us identify our own natural sanctuaries, understand the value of these places to our collective mental health, and be an advocate for their protection. Nature needs us, and we need nature. Frank and Jeannie Moore were the unintentional pioneers of this effort. Before PTSD, before forest bathing, even before Chuck Norris said so, Frank and Jeannie were the preeminent champions for their own natural sanctuary 
on the North Umpqua River. As a veteran of World War II, Frank was not immune to the trauma of war. And when he returned, uh, he spent days fly fishing. So many, in fact, that his wife Jeannie placed an ad in the Roseburg newspaper. Lost, one owner and manager of Moore's Cafe. Last seen up the North Umpqua River. In the early 60s, Frank and Jeannie found the North Umpqua River and its tributaries under threat from destructive logging practices and greedy local interests. Their story would define a legacy. Every spring, the buds pop, the leaves come out again, and it's an ongoing cycle. And boy, I've had going on 95 cycles now. <laughs> In June 1944, I came ashore in Normandy at Utah Beach. For the next year, as part of the 453rd, we fought our way through France, Luxembourg, Belgium, and on into Germany. I didn't live. I existed. I saw things that you never get over. It's always with you. I'm grateful that for some reason, I was able to come back. Frank and I were married 75 years ago, just before he had to ship out for World War II. When he returned, like so many of the other young men, he was struggling with what we today call PTSD. All of a sudden, I'd start to break down just bawling like a baby. And I wouldn't be as loving as I could have been to my wonderful wife. I suppose I thought it, it might have something to do with the war because I know he didn't talk to me about it. I didn't know how to help him, but I could see that he felt a sense of peace when he was fly fishing on the North Umpqua. I can still remember how I'd be standing out there and watching the swallows fly around in the evening. Looking up and see the, the rock bluffs of the beautiful North Umpqua Steamboat. Looking down and see a big steelhead swirl at the bottom of the pool. Steamboat Creek and his, all of its tributaries was set aside with no angling back in, in the 20s. And it is truly amazing that back then, someone had enough foresight to realize that this had to be protected. It's because of these protected spawning grounds that the North Umpqua River is the incredible fishery for wild steelhead that it is. Over the years, I have seen abuses to this watershed that are not to the benefit of the land, the waters, or the American people. I would take a temperature above a clear cut. It would be, in the summertime, usually be 56, 57 degrees, and go down below where the clear cut was, and it'd go up as high as 84. Just a short distance, it would climb 30 degrees. It doesn't take many like that to wipe out all life within a stream. Frank and I have worked a lot of years to protect this place. The legislation that is proposed is designed to recognize Steamboat Creek as a special place for wildlife, plants, and people. The area will be called the Frank and Jean Moore Wild Steelhead Sanctuary, and it encompasses 100,000 acres, all the drainages within the Steamboat Creek. It's also a sanctuary where people can go and have a rebirth or rebuilding their soul. The natural world helps people heal. How lovely is the hand of God that smooths the rough place man has trod.
Frank isn't the only veteran struggling with PTSD who has found fly fishing on places like the North Umpqua to be therapeutic. Rusty Linninger served eight years in the US Army and also found healing for his PTSD through fly fishing. In 2016, he started Source One Serenity, a nonprofit that provides fly fishing retreats on the Umpqua geared specifically for combat veterans. Numerous other organizations are emerging across the US whose mission it is to heal struggling veterans by immersing them in natural sanctuaries. There are a few projections for our future which are concerning. Our population is expected to grow to nearly 10 billion by 2050. Today, over half of us live in cities and will continue to tip the scales towards a more urban lifestyle. This means more people living more disconnected from nature, which trends and studies suggest is will continue to erode away our collective mental health. Whether it's the most remote place, the North Umpqua River, or the neighborhood park, all are valuable and all are vulnerable. If conservation initiatives feel impractical, consider our veterans returning from war, our children growing up in an urbanized world, or the one in five of us in this room that struggle with our own mental health. For us, natural sanctuaries matter. Frank and Jeannie are great examples of the more than words effort it takes to protect a place on behalf of the plants, animals, and people that seek sanctuary there. Look in your own backyard to see where nature needs help and be a champion for its protection. Nature needs us and we need nature. Like Frank and Jeannie, we all have the capacity to save our sanctuaries. <laughs>